Um, that means we're ready to start closing arguments, and the state gets to go first since the state's got the burden of proof. And Ms. Andrews, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. It is time for you to grow up and be a good dad and a good mom. Don't start using your child as a pawn, or you will draw the wrath of this court. That was very sound advice given by a Maricopa County Superior Court judge on December 17, 2009. But Elizabeth Johnson, the defendant, she didn't listen. And in fact, unknown to that Superior Court judge on that date, she was already using that child as a pawn. And her desire to use that child against Logan McQuarrie, against his own father, led to a disastrous situation and forever altered the lives of both Gabriel Johnson and Logan McQuarrie. Now you heard some testimony about the rocky relationship that Elizabeth and Logan had both before and after they had Gabriel Johnson. And you heard testimony about the times when they appeared to be a happy family going on walks together. But at some point in time, Elizabeth Johnson got angry at Logan McQuery. And she decided that she was gonna take him away from his son and exclude him from her family. And she enlisted the help of Tammy Smith, who had her own desires, because Tammy Smith wanted Gabriel Johnson for herself. And together, the two of them engaged in this, these acts, which led to forever altering those lives of Logan McQuarrie and Gabriel Johnson. So on May 3rd, 2009, Gabriel Scott Johnson is born to Logan Scott McQuarrie and Elizabeth Joanne Johnson. He's given the same middle name as his father and his grandfather, and Logan is listed on the birth certificate. At this time, Logan and Elizabeth start a family. Now between May and June, the relationship is still rocky. So in June of 2000, when Gabriel is only about a month old, they have a fight. Elizabeth and Logan have a fight and Elizabeth flees. She goes to Boston and she takes Gabriel Johnson with her. And Logan has no idea where they are until Elizabeth calls him up and tells him, I miss my family, I wanna come home. But while they're in the airport waiting to come home, Elizabeth Johnson meets Tammy Smith. And Tammy Smith wants to adopt Gabriel Johnson. So they exchange a phone number Elizabeth gets Tammy Smith's phone number. And then Tammy Smith does not hear from Elizabeth again until December of 2009. Now Logan and Elizabeth, they continue to have a rocky relationship. But they're making a home, they're making a family. You've heard testimony about how they appeared to be happy, how the neighbors saw them go on walks together, how they saw Logan cleaning up the house, making it nice how they saw him out in the yard working on the house, but, but loving and caring for Gabriel. But then in September of 2009, they have a fight. And Logan asks his father to pick Gabriel Johnson up from daycare. And he does. And Elizabeth falsely accuses them of kidnapping Gabriel Johnson. Now this act isn't one of the charged offenses, but you can consider this act for Elizabeth Johnson's intent in the crimes that are charged. So on December 8, 2009, they again have a fight. And Logan McQuarrie decides, you know what, this is it. This time I'm gonna go. And Elizabeth tells him, take the baby with you. And so he does, and he goes to his grandmother's home in Mesa. And while Logan and Gabriel are at the grandmother's home in Mesa, they get a call from the police who say that they're missing and that he has to return Gabriel Johnson back to his mother. And Logan asks the police officer to meet him there. 
and he goes and he returns Gabriel Johnson to Elizabeth Johnson. And then Logan goes and he remains at his dad's house. Now Elizabeth, for the first time since June of 2009, picks up the phone and calls Tammy Smith and offers her up her son. This is the very last day that Logan has seen his son. In the afternoon on December 9th, 2009, Elizabeth meets the Smiths, and then they go and they sign a temporary guardianship document. And Tammy Smith then calls Deanne Ayala from a store, and she says, we have a baby, we have a baby. And Deanne says, well, what do you mean you have a baby? And Tammy tells her about the woman she met in the airport in June of 2009 has given her her baby. And Deanne's a little weary on that. She's like, well, that's kind of strange. What about the father? Logan goes to work on December 9th, 2009. And on December 9th, 2009, he gets phone calls repeatedly from Elizabeth Johnson. And you heard the testimony from the witnesses who say she was calling him repeatedly. You also heard the testimony from the officers that Elizabeth claimed she was getting phone calls and she got worried. So she shows up at Logan's work and she tells him he needs to sign adoption papers. And he has no idea what she's talking about because they haven't discussed having Gabriel adopted. And she chases him down the hall and into the office. And so the people who work at the 99 cent store, they contact the police and the police come out. The Tempe Police Department arrive at 6.41 p.m. that day. And Elizabeth again tells police that Logan has kidnapped his child. And it causes an all out search. The police are contacting Logan's family. They're trying to find out where he's hiding the baby. Logan's father shows up at the 99 cent store. Logan and his father cooperate, they give phone numbers, they give addresses, the police go out to Elizabeth's home to look for the baby. This is an all out search that goes on into the late night hours and early morning hours of December 10th. All this time, Logan has no idea where Gabriel Johnson is. Elizabeth is telling the officers lies on this day. She's telling the officers that that morning is the morning that she said that Logan and Gabriel were missing and the officer Williams came out. But Officer Travis Smith, he confirms that's not true and he confronts her about it. Well, that happened last night. We know what happened last night because we ran the call. You're not telling us the truth. Where is Gabriel Johnson? And finally, in the morning hours of December 10th, 2009, Elizabeth Johnson fesses up and tells them that Gabriel Johnson is actually with Tammy and Jack Smith. And they go out, the police go out, Detective Aguilera testified about how they found Gabriel safe and sound at the Smith's home, sleeping in a bassinet. And Logan McQuarrie is advised that Gabriel is safe, but he's not told where he is or who he's with. And so on December 10th, 2009, Logan and his dad start talking. And they decide they're going to go to court on December 11th, 2009, and they're going to file for custody. Logan also makes a report to Child Protective Services. And he talks to Alicia Shumway, the caseworker, and he tells Alicia what's happening. And she can't meet with him right then because he's on his way to court to file for custody papers. So Alicia meets with Elizabeth. And when she meets with Elizabeth, she first gets there to Elizabeth's home. But Elizabeth won't let her in because she's selling her dogs. So finally, Alicia Shumway gets to go in the house. The dogs are gone. And she talks to Elizabeth. <coughs> and they talk about the fact that Logan's filing for custody. And they talk about the fact that Gabriel's with the Smiths. And they talk about the fact that Elizabeth says she gave Gabriel up for adoption. And Alicia Shumway of CPS is concerned about that because she knows that Logan McQuarrie is not interested in having his child adopted. And she tells Elizabeth this. And then Alicia Shumway calls Tammy Smith on the phone. 
Now, Tammy Smith has had Gabriel since December 9th. Tammy Smith had temporary guardianship paperwork, giving her temporary guardianship of Gabriel. Yet she tells Alicia Shumway on the phone that day, oh, we're just babysitting Gabriel while Elizabeth looks for a job. That night, that morning, before Alicia Shumway met with her, Elizabeth had posted on MySpace to her friend, Sassy Cassie, hey girl, call me, here's my new phone number. I gave the baby up for adoption. So December 11th, Elizabeth Johnson is telling other people she's given that baby up for adoption. Same baby she gave away on December 9th. Between December 11th and December 12th, 2009, Malcolm Phipps responds to an ad on Craigslist. An ad for a roommate in the home that Logan had just left on the 8th. On December 13th, 2009, Logan reaches out to Elizabeth Johnson and he tells her what his intentions are. He tells her, I am sorry the way things are, but I think it is for the best. We tried and tried to make things work. Maybe it was you, maybe it was me, maybe it was actually some of both. He says, you will never know how much I really do love you, babe. This hurts me a lot. All I wanted to do when I saw you last was hug and kiss you, but I knew I couldn't. This is hard for the both of us, and I wish I could call and talk to you. I am feeling a lot of different things, but we can't. We need to spend some time not talking. You need to be strong, babe. I know you are a very strong person, and I know it might be hard at first, but we both need to be apart. And we tried, but all we did was drag each other down. You can get your life back like you've always said you wanted, and to relax and have some peace. On December 14th, 2009, Alicia Shumway from CPS is able to meet with Logan for the first time. And on that day, he learns about the Smiths for the first time. At 1.30 p.m., and now this is important, Alicia Shumway testified that at 1.30 p.m., she met with Elizabeth, Gabriel, and Tammy at Elizabeth's home. On this particular day, she confronted Elizabeth about the lying about the adoption. Because Elizabeth is now telling Alicia Shumway, she has no idea what she's talking about when she says Elizabeth gave the baby up for adoption. She is completely denying the previous conversation she had with Alicia Shumway. And Alicia confronts Elizabeth about it while Tammy Smith sits there quietly and watches. So Alicia Shumway leaves the home. And at the time she left the home, after confronting Elizabeth and having a conversation and telling Tammy Smith to stay out of the custody dispute, she assumes that Gabriel will remain with Elizabeth Johnson. Elizabeth gets served with a petition for custody, which she was already aware because Alicia had already talked to her about it. Tammy Smith talks to her cousin, Craig Cherry, on the telephone. And then they go to the courthouse. Tammy and Elizabeth go down to the courthouse to file their response to the petition for custody. And while at the courthouse, Tammy Smith picks up the phone and she calls her friend Deanne Ayala. And she asks Deanne, can I use your husband's name on the court document to say he's a potential father? And Deanne is like, why would you do that? No, you can't use my husband's name. And Tammy tells her they want to put additional names on the court document because they want to delay the paternity filing for Logan. At 5.18 p.m. that day, now remember Alicia Shumway met with them at 1.30 p.m.? 5.18 p.m., they file the response. It's a false court document that lists Craig Cherry as a possible biological father of Gabriel Johnson. Now you heard testimony and you actually have in evidence Alan Cridle's report that has the document in it, that has the different handwritings on the pages and the date stamp of the time it was filed into court that day. 
And you can see that both Elizabeth jo Johnson and Tammy Smith filled out different portions of each of the same pages. You will see that it's actually Tammy Smith's handwriting that lists the name Craig Cherry, but right after Craig Cherry is listed, you'll see handwriting in Elizabeth Johnson's handwriting. On December 14, 2009, Elizabeth is now responding to Logan McQuarrie's earlier MySpace communication. And she talks. She's nice to Logan in this communication. She talks about open adoption. She talks about how their relationship is unhealthy and that they should go on with their lives and Logan should go get his life together as well. But Logan responds on December 15, 2009. And he tells her, please don't fight me on this. Let me take care of Gabriel. I can try and give him a good life. And you even said you can't take care of him right now. I want to see him so bad. Don't do this because you are mad at me. I can take care of him. On December 16, 2009, Elizabeth Johnson and Logan McQuarrie as is par for their relationship, they spend the night together, they get back together for a night, and they agree that they'll share joint custody of Gabriel Johnson. And then they go their separate ways. But then they show up to court on December 17, 2009, and it's Elizabeth and Logan and Frank McQuarrie. Elizabeth and Frank McQuarrie are not the best of friends. Frank's sitting in the back of the courtroom while Elizabeth and Logan are sitting at the council tables and they have a conversation with the judge. And on this date, paternity is established. The judge finds that Logan is on the birth certificate and he finds that he is the father and establishes paternity. This is important because under the custodial interference statute, until paternity is established, Logan McQuarrie has no rights to Gabriel Johnson, which is why the police previously told him he had to return that baby back to Elizabeth Johnson. But on December 17, 2009, he now has paternity. And the judge advises Elizabeth Johnson that if she wants to challenge that paternity, exactly how she needs to go about doing it with a DNA test. And at this particular time, Elizabeth agrees to paternity. Then the judge explains to them a parenting conference. Now, a parenting conference is very important. Because as the judge said, he doesn't have time to do a trial that day. These people are in front of him for the first time. He has nothing but their petition in response with the allegations against each other. And he's trying to make some quick decisions about what's going to happen to this child in the meantime. So he explains to them, and in the documents we filed uh, that we admitted into evidence, there's some explanation of what a parenting conference is, but he explains to them what that is. They're going to sit down with somebody and they're going to go over everything. And they're going to make determinations to decide what's best for Gabriel. But on December 17, 2009, the judge asked Logan some information about what's in his petition. And this starts the accusations back and forth. Because until this, Elizabeth and Logan had agreed on joint custody. But now it brings up these allegations that they've made against each other. Logan tries to explain to the judge why he called CPS. And what he was trying to explain is that Elizabeth Johnson had given the baby away to the Smiths. But this is not the trial. This is not the time for there to be testimony taken. And, and the judge has to make some quick decisions about what happens. And so Logan doesn't get the opportunity to explain that to the judge. And then they agree. Elizabeth and Logan finally agree on joint custody. Elizabeth specifically asked the judge for Logan to have the baby on Sundays because she has a class she wants to attend. So the court orders that Logan has Gabriel Sundays through Wednesday and on Christmas Eve. The first time that Logan was supposed to have Gabriel Johnson would be that following Sunday, December 20th, 2009. But on Friday, December 18th, the day after this court hearing, Elizabeth Johnson, she's not going to listen to the judge. She doesn't care that he said, don't use your child as a pawn. She's going to anyway. It's been her intent all along. So on December 18th, 2009, which is Friday, at 10.05 in the morning, she clears out her bank account in Tempe, Arizona, except for $5 and change. 
But at 5.55 p.m. that day in Scottsdale, she clears out the $5 and change. Five minutes away from the Glass and Garden Community Church, where she had met the Smiths to pick up Gabriel Johnson. The Smiths give Gabriel to Elizabeth. They've had him since the 9th. She then calls Logan McQuarrie, and she tells him that day, you will never see your son again. Now, she knows that Logan is supposed to see him on the 20th. And there is no order that says, Elizabeth Johnson, you and Gabriel cannot leave the state on December 18, 2009. She had every right to take that child in the car and leave the state on December 18, 2009. She could have stayed there on December 19, 2009 because the judge didn't tell her she couldn't. But by 8 o'clock in the morning on Sunday the 20th, Gabriel Johnson was supposed to be with Logan McQuarrie. But on December 18th, 2009, despite the fact that she had a legal right to leave with Gabriel, she doesn't say, hey, we're going away for a weekend. She tells Logan McQuarrie on that day, you will never see your son again. And she leaves. And she knows then that it would be a violation of the court order. And Logan has absolutely no idea where she's going or what she's doing or what she means when she says, you will never see your son again. And so he calls the court. And the court says, find out what happens on the 20th and come see us if she doesn't bring Gabriel to you. And so on the 20th, 2009, Logan's father gets fed up and he says, you got to record your conversations with Elizabeth Johnson. And here's a recorder. And together, Frank and Logan go to the home on December 20th, 2009, and they look for Elizabeth and they look for Gabriel. And he's not, she's not there. They don't find the baby stuff in the home. The baby stuff is, is not there. They don't see Malcolm at this point. They then spend the next few days trying to find them. And they can't find them. She, Elizabeth has no cell phone. And when she does get a cell phone number, Logan does not get that until December 22nd, 2009. So there's no way to reach her. So on December 21st, 2009, Logan goes to court, and he tells the judge what has happened, and the judge orders that Logan has temporary emergency custody and gives him a warrant to take with him to take custody of that child from Elizabeth Johnson. So now Logan has sole custody of that child. And he contacts the police, and the police can't really help him search and find this child, but they said they could take custody of the child if he finds the child. So they go back to the home, and they try and find Elizabeth again, and she's not there. So Frank and Logan do their own research from their home, and they find a phone number for Jack and Tammy Smith, and they call it. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about statements. In this particular case, there are some statements that you're going to hear and some statements that you're not. If you recall when Cynthia from the 99 cent store testified, the judge had to remind her a few times not to testify about what other people were saying. And that's because Cynthia didn't have the opportunity to go to law school and find out all these weird rules we have about what statements you can hear and what statements you can't. Um, if you recall when Detective Ramirez was testifying, I reminded her that she couldn't testify as to what statements Tammy Smith had made to her. The reason for that is actually in your jury instructions on page 7. So now we can hear Logan McQuarrie's statements because he was here and he testified. We can hear Elizabeth Johnson's statements because the rules allow for that. We can hear some of Tammy Smith's statements. And the reason we can only hear some of Tammy Smith's statements is because they have to be statements by her made in furtherance of the conspiracy while the conspiracy is still happening, not before or after. So any statements Tammy Smith made to the detective, those are not admissible. Any statements she made before a conspiracy are not admissible. And any statements that she made that had nothing to do with the conspiracy don't come in. But we know that there were phone calls between Elizabeth Johnson, or between Tammy Smith and Logan McQuarrie, because we heard testimony from different sources about those phone calls. And we know that Logan McQuarrie recorded those phone calls and provided those recorded phone calls to the police. And so they talked for a while. 
On December 21st, 2009, they finally get a phone number. Elizabeth, they have a phone number for Elizabeth Johnson who obtains a cell phone at some point. And they give the phone number to Logan McQuarrie. And Jack tells him when he gives the number to him, let us handle it. And at this point in time, as Logan testified, he trusts the Smiths. He liked them. And so he agreed not to call Elizabeth on this phone number that he had. And so he doesn't call her. On December 22, 2009, Logan and the Smiths continue to communicate. But then the relationship changes because then there's a phone call where the Smiths tell Logan he needs to sign adoption papers. Wait five days and Elizabeth will come home and he'll get to see Gabriel again. So the Smiths tell Logan that if you want to see your son, you'll sign adoption papers. On December 22, 2009, the communications between Elizabeth and Logan begin on MySpace. So they're not talking on the phone, but they are communicating on MySpace. Now remember, she's been gone since the 18th, and Logan is not calling her, and she's getting pretty upset about it. And she tells him, you don't care about me or us or our family. You only care about yourself. You treated me like your enemy instead of the woman you love and made your son. You were so quick to put yourself as single and take my pick down to start your new life and ditch me. So this is what I'm going, and that's actually how the actual text message ends. He responds back to her. He says, Elizabeth, I'm sorry, Tammy contacts her first. And she says, Elizabeth, please call us and let us know you and Gabriel are okay. We are all worried, as you can expect, and we have some very important information that you really, really need to hear before this weekend. And she gives a phone number. She says it's very serious, and she signs it, Tammy slash Jack. Then there's a phone call again between Tammy and Logan, and they talk for a while. And then Elizabeth responds to Tammy, and she says, hey, it's Elizabeth. I'm sorry I was going to call but have been scared. We are all right, though. I can't talk right now. What serious information do I need to know? And Tammy responds, call me. It's too much to tell over a text. We will not judge you. Just call me. Now keep in mind, we have recorded phone calls between Logan and Tammy Smith. We have recorded phone calls between Logan and Elizabeth Johnson. But you will see from the evidence and from the information I'm going to provide you from the evidence, that there are numerous phone calls between Tammy Smith and Elizabeth Johnson, and we have no idea what's in them. There's no way to get them. They're not recorded like Logan's phone calls were. So we have no idea what they were saying, but we know that Tammy wants to speak to Elizabeth Johnson urgently. And then there are some conversations between Elizabeth and Tammy and Tammy and Logan. And then we taught, we heard, you heard some information about when we can get the context from text messages and when we can't, and the dates in which they were able to get the content. We could get the content from Tammy Smith's text messages, but only so far back to a certain date. So we can see that they had communications via text, but we can't see until, until later on what those actual texts said. So on December 22, 2009, we know Elizabeth and Tammy are texting each other, we just don't know what they say. There are additional conversations happening. Tammy texts Logan at 1.33 p.m. on December 22nd, 2009. And I should probably explain what's on the screen there a little bit. The first time is Arizona time. The second time is San Antonio time. And it, then it'll say a name to in person. So Tammy to Logan. And the time listed out there is how long the, the call was. So if it's a phone call, you'll see, you'll see minutes and seconds. In this particular case, you see that phone call from 12.52 p.m. to 12.52 p.m., Tammy to Logan, because they're both in Arizona, and it's 25 seconds. It's probably a call that didn't go through. So now on December 22nd, 1.33 p.m., you have a text message from Tammy to Logan. And it says, can we get together tomorrow morning to talk with you and your dad? I'm afraid she'll be gone forever because she doesn't want to go to jail for kidnapping. She doesn't trust you or your dad. The only way she'll come back is if my attorney 
fax the signed paperwork to her so she won't get in trouble and Gabriel will be with us. So again, Tammy Smith is trying to get Logan to sign adoption papers so his baby will return. And Logan's not having anything to do with it now. Now he's caught on to Tammy and Jack Smith. And he says, no, Monday when she fails to appear, the judge will issue a warrant for arrest. Anyone who has helped her will be subject to an arrest as an accessory, and they are going to issue an Amber Alert for Elizabeth and the baby. I am not signing any adoption paperwork. I want my son. And so Tammy backs off. I will tell her this. I understand. We'll pray about it. I hope she does the right thing. Let us know if we can do anything. God bless. She will be in court when she's supposed to be. She's in touch with the court. She just needed to get away from all this stress and have a happy Christmas. Now we know that Elizabeth Johnson is fully aware that there is a court date and that there's another order that occurred on December 21st, 2009. There's some com continued communications between Elizabeth and Tammy. Again, we have no idea what they said to each other on the phone. There are some additional communications. And then we move on to December 23rd, 2009. There are numerous communications on the telephone between Tammy and Elizabeth on December 23rd, 2009. On December 24th, 2009, Christmas Eve, Tammy sends a text message to her friend in Tennessee. And she says, what's Janet's phone number? She knows a good adoption attorney. Now remember, Tammy Smith is very, very clear that Logan's not interested in giving his baby up for adoption. He made it as clear as he possibly could in the last text communication he had with Tammy Smith. But she's looking for an adoption attorney in Tennessee. There are some communications back. At 12.37 p.m. on December 24, 2009, Tammy Smith is given Janet Morris's phone number. I didn't put it up on the screen because I don't want people to call poor Janet Morris. There are some additional communications between Tammy and Elizabeth. Christmas Day, 2009. Elizabeth and Tammy text each other, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. A little bit of some phone calls, not too much. Until later. There's additional phone conversations between Tammy Smith and Elizabeth Johnson on Christmas Day. One of them is 42 minutes and 46 seconds long. Another one is 26 minutes and 26 seconds long. And then there's a text. On December 26, 2009, Tammy Smith sends to Elizabeth Johnson the phone number for Janet Morris in Tennessee. And she says, this is the number to my friend Janet Morris in Tennessee. Call her. She can give you all the legal advice you need to know. Then call me and we'll talk, Tammy. Now keep in mind, there's a court hearing coming up in Arizona. She doesn't send her the phone number for an attorney in Arizona. She sends her the information for somebody who can give her legal advice in the state of Tennessee. And if you remember back to Deanna Aiello's testimony, who said that when she talked to Tammy Smith during this time period, Tammy Smith talked to her about changing jurisdictions. They know there's court orders in Arizona. They know a judge. A judge told Elizabeth and Logan, don't go out to another court and file things against each other. That'll make your judge really mad. But yet now they're looking into Tennessee to change jurisdictions, just as Deanne told you that Tammy wanted to do. That Tammy and Elizabeth were talking about changing jurisdictions to another state so that they could ignore the court orders in Arizona. On December 26, 2009, Logan calls Elizabeth for the first time since she left. And in this conversation, Elizabeth is pretty angry. She asks him what he wants. She says he's going around making up things about her, harassing everyone she knows. She says that he and his family are pathetic. He, she says that he should be ashamed of herself. She says he's acting childish. She says he's playing games, that he's trying to get attention. 
She tells him, I am allowed to move. She tells him she has friends, and then she tells him that there's a lawyer who's going to show up for court on the 28th. Now, Elizabeth is right. When she says she's allowed to move, she absolutely is right. She can pick up and move wherever she wants. There is no law that says you can't move. But taking Gabriel Johnson with her in violation of the court orders, that is not what she is allowed to do. On December 26, 2009, there are some additional phone calls between Elizabeth and Tammy. Then Elizabeth makes a phone call to Janet Morris at 2.38 p.m. Arizona time. And when she makes that phone call to Janet Morris, it's 37 <coughs> seconds long, she probably left a message. And Ele Janet Morris calls her back, and they talk for 49 minutes and 46 seconds. Now, other than a quick phone call Elizabeth makes to her friend Soren that probably didn't go through, this is the last phone call Elizabeth had before she called Logan McQuarrie and told him she killed his son. On December 27, 2009, Tammy is trying to reach Elizabeth. She calls, she doesn't get her. She calls, she doesn't get her. She says, she sends her a text. Is everything okay? I've tried calling you and it keeps disconnecting. She calls and calls. Now Tammy Smith is starting to get worried because Logan, or because Elizabeth has changed the plan. Elizabeth has gone off on her own. On December 27, 2009, Logan gets this text. I killed him. And Logan picks up the phone and he calls Elizabeth and they have a conversation. Now you've heard the call, and you can hear the call as many times as you want when you go back to deliberations. You have the transcript. We've agreed that you could have the transcript. I am not going to read to you everything that's in the transcript, and I'm not going to play the call again because the quality isn't that great. But there are some things from that call I want to point out. Elizabeth says to him, You made me do it, Logan. I wasn't going to let you take him from me. All you want to do is take him from me. He says, you can't send a mess text message saying you killed my son. She says, you did it. He says, did what? She says, you did it. You didn't care about me. He says, where are you and why are you saying you killed Gabriel? And she says, I just did it, Logan. She says, you went to your dad and betrayed me. You promised me. You promised me you would never do that again, and you did. You can't break promises. You can't lie to people. And Logan says, Elizabeth, you pushed me into this situation. And she says, you made me kill my baby. She asks, what does it matter where I am? I don't exist anymore. All my identification is gone. And he says, where are you? And again, she says, I don't exist anymore. I'm a ghost. I wasn't going to let you take him from me. I sacrificed everything. And you think you can just come and take him and give him to your family? He's mine. I won't let you do that. He says, you're not going to hurt Gabriel. And now she's convincing him that, in fact, she could hurt Gabriel. This is where she is trying to tell him, oh, yes, I could very well hurt Gabriel. He says, you love him, too. You would not hurt Gabriel. You know you wouldn't. And she said, well, you would be surprised what a person is capable of when you push them enough. And he says, what? And she repeats it. I said you would be surprised what a person would do when you push them enough. She's trying to convince him that, in fact, she could very well hurt his child. I'm not pushing you. I gave you your space, he says. I want to be able to see my son, he says. Where are you and where is Gabriel? And she responds, Gabriel's in the dumpster. They talk about her accusing him of having affairs. He says, where are you and where's Gabriel? And she says, I told you that I killed him this morning. He says, you what? And she said, I killed him this morning. He said, no, you didn't. And she keeps trying to convince him. He says, where are you? She says, until my money runs out, then I'm nowhere. 
When my money runs out, my life runs out. You don't care about me. I couldn't do it alone and I couldn't do it anymore. You wanted to take the only thing I had in life you wanted to take from me. You were going to make me miserable. They communicate about how Logan feels about Gabriel and that he loves him. He asks her, he says, I want to see him. I haven't seen him since December 8th. He says, where are you? And again, she's going to try and convince him that she would in fact hurt Gabriel. You knew what I was capable of. You knew what I am capable of, and you pushed me away. And he then keeps asking her, where are you? Where are you? And she says again, you don't, don't you care about me? All you care about is Gabriel. And she tells him, you're doing this. And he says, no, you're doing this. And she said, it's already been done, Logan. So tell me why you did it. Tell me, huh? And he's, he's done at this point. He says, I'm not going to have this conversation with you until you tell me where you're at. And again, he says it again. Tell, I'm not going to have this conversation with you. Tell me where exactly you are. And, she's, and she talks to him. She says, he destroyed everything. And he said, I haven't destroyed anything, Elizabeth. And she says, yes, you have, Logan. You made me kill my baby boy. You think I can live after that? You can because you're cold-hearted. You never loved me. You just used me. And Logan is done at this point. He says, I have to go. And, and she keeps talking to him. And she says, I told you, you made me do this. And he says, you did not hurt Gabriel. And now she's really going to convince him. Yes, I did. I suffocated him. I covered him up with a towel and I suffocated him. And he turned blue and I put him in his diaper bag. And I put him in the trash can. And Logan responds, I need to go. And she says, why, to call the police? And he's trying again to get her to tell him where she is. And she just wants to talk about what he's done to her. And she, he says again, you're doing this. And she says, it's already done, Logan. It's already over with. It's done. And he says, I got to go. Bye. And he hangs up the phone. Logan McQuarrie then goes to the police department. He goes to the Mesa Police Department because that's where he is. He's in the car, leaving his grandmother's home, and he heads over to the Mesa Police Department. And they told him they can't help him. And you saw him on the stand when he talked about that, when he showed up at the Mesa Police Department with a text message that said she had killed his son. And so he went to the Tempe Police Department, and he met his dad there. And Officer Snell took him seriously. Officer Snell looked at his phone, and he saw the text message. Now Logan McQuarrie is there at the police department. He's giving the recorder to Officer Snell. He's giving the cell phone to Officer Snell and his battery has died. And he has to wait for his dad to get there to get him a new phone battery. And when they get the new phone battery and turn it on, they find more text messages from Elizabeth Johnson. At the same time that she's text messaging Logan McQuarrie, about what she says she has done to Gabriel Johnson. Tammy is text messaging Elizabeth Johnson. Now, if you recall, before she told Logan that she had killed Gabriel, Tammy asked if she was okay. And she responds now to Tammy. No, I'm not okay. I am upset and scared. And Tammy says, call me, call me, I'm here for you. What's going on? Has done something? <coughs> And right after that, Logan's getting his text messages from Elizabeth that say, coward bitch, pathetic loser, run to daddy. Fine, don't talk to me, asshole, but you will never see Gabriel again. I made sure of that. And you can spend the rest of your <coughs> pathetic life wondering about him. You will never find me. I'm already boarding a plane out of the country. When I'm safe, I'll email you the exact location of dead Gabriel's little blue body. If the garbage does not come first. Well, I'm done with you two fucks. This is what liars like you deserve. Now, Tammy's getting freaked out. This is not in her plan. Her plan is not for Elizabeth Johnson to disappear. Elizabeth is not responding back to Tammy about where she is and where the baby is. 
So Tammy says, please call me. I'm worried about you. I have something about my past I want to tell you. We're more alike than you'll ever know. And Elizabeth responds, I hate myself. I can never do anything right. Now, Tammy is trying to convince her that everything's okay. And if she just comes back, everything will be okay. And they communicate. And she tells her about her past. And she talks about coming and staying with us. Elizabeth says to Tammy Smith, it's too late for me. And Tammy says, Smith said, no, you're not. Who said that? And she said, your lawyer told me that yesterday. And Tammy asks about a lawyer by the name of Ken Shutt. And Elizabeth responds and says, no, the girl one. Now, you remember the day before she talked to Janet Morris in Tennessee. Now, Tammy Smith has talked to her lawyer, and she's trying to tell Elizabeth everything's okay. You just have to, have to come to the next court date. Everything's okay. And she's trying to get Elizabeth to come back at this point. And she tells Elizabeth to keep her hotel receipts, though, because Tammy Smith doesn't want to be taken down for the fact that maybe Elizabeth was with her during this time period. Now she's again trying to get her to come back for a court hearing. But Elizabeth Johnson responds. When Tammy Smith says, let me know I can get you an attorney, let me know ASAP. And Elizabeth says, no, I don't plan on going, so don't. I'm just going to stay in hiding. Now remember, Elizabeth said she could move away. She could get a job. But yet somehow she's staying in hiding. Well, so Tammy, she tells her she's making a mistake and says, I'm not going to help you break the law at this point. She's trying to convince her that she needs to come back with Gabriel. Now, at this point, Tammy Smith has learned what has happened with Elizabeth Johnson calling Gabriel. Before then, she didn't know. She didn't know Elizabeth had said she had killed Gabriel. Tammy's trying to get the baby to come back because she wants to adopt him. But then she learns from the police because the police want to know, is Gabriel with you? And when she finds out why they're looking for Gabriel, she says to Elizabeth, you need to call me. I need to hear Gabriel cry, even if you have to pinch him. The police called me and listened to a message from you saying, you killed Gabriel. Please call ASAP. And Elizabeth responds, and she tells Tammy, I'm driving, I have no reception. Yes, I texted Logan that to hurt him and mess with him to get back at him. So now she said what her intent was behind the phone call to Logan McQuarrie. Tammy's asking her to call when she has reception. She wants to know if Gabriel is okay. And Elizabeth said, well, they already called, meaning the police, and we got disconnected. My cell doesn't have good reception unless I'm in a city, but I will try. Tammy, again, still trying to reach Elizabeth, trying to get her to come back, trying to get her to stop somewhere and show them that Gabriel's okay. Now, she sends this message. She knows what's happening because she's been in touch with the police. But she's trying to get Elizabeth to come back. So she says to her, I don't know if Logan found you or hurt you or something. But she knows that's not true because she's trying to bring her back at this point because the plan has gone all awry. This was not Tammy Smith's plan. There are some phone calls. Logan's trying to reach Elizabeth. Tammy's trying to reach Elizabeth. Logan's trying to reach Tammy. Everybody's trying to talk to each other to find out what's going on. On December 29th, 2009, we finally hear from Elizabeth Johnson. She says, Tammy, I will never come forward. Yes, what I said was wrong, but I wanted him to hurt like he hurt me. So that's why I said all that. Me and Gabriel are fine. In fact, I just got a full-time job under a fake name, and the owner is very understanding of my situation and is willing to help me get new IDs and stuff. I cannot let you or anyone else know where I am. Just know I am getting lots of help. I am very smart and resourceful, and that I am one of the most competent people you will ever meet. I have always taken care of myself by myself as long as I can remember. 
I can't call in fear for phone records. I am ever worried this email can be traced back to where I am, so I probably won't email again. But I had to let you know we are all right, because I know you must be worried sick. And I am so sorry for that, I really am. You and Jack are such good people. I'd like you to keep this in mind, this conversation that they had, when we talk about the confrontation call a little bit later. Now, Elizabeth was right. That email can be traced, and in fact it was. It was that conversation that allowed the police to locate Elizabeth Johnson in Miami Beach, Florida. She's located there, and she has no, doesn't have Gabriel with her. Elizabeth first lies about her name. She tells Detective Alaska she's Victoria Evans. And if you recall from the stipulation about Mikhail Kadash, she actually signed in under Victoria Evans at that hostel. But when she's confronted with the photograph of herself on the flyer, she admits to Detective Velasquez who she is. And then she and Detective Velasquez talk, and remember what she told Detective Velasquez? She drove the car to Miami and took a, car, took a cab to Miami Beach. She told the detective that she gave the baby to a couple she met in a park in San Antonio, Texas. And then in the early morning hours of New Year's Eve, she has a conversation with Special Agent Chavez. And essentially, she tells Special Agent Chavez the same information she tells Detective Velasquez, except that she tells him she met the couple in the park, but she gave the baby away to the couple the next day at the hotel. Now, on January 5th, 2010, Elizabeth speaks to her grandfather, Tammy Smith, Jack Smith, and a reporter on the telephone while she's still in Miami Beach. She tells them where her car is. In fact, she tells them that the FBI knew all along, which is not true. But she tells them the car is in a Motel, parking, Motel 6 parking lot across from the bus station. On January 11, 2010, the police learn about the tip about Craig Cherry on the paperwork. On January 14, 2010, the detective picks up that paperwork, and Detective Ramirez notices that there's two different handwritings on it, and the middle name for Joanne is spelled incorrectly. Tammy Smith is interviewed there at the police station. And then on January 22, 2010, a confrontation call is conducted between Elizabeth and Tammy Smith. Now, Elizabeth has agreed to do this phone call. And in the phone call, if you recall, she is accusing Tammy Smith of setting up this couple who took the baby. But if you remember from the text message I asked you to remember about, she told Tammy Smith that she and Gabriel were fine. So obviously, Tammy Smith didn't set up this couple. Now, I want to talk about the confrontation call. You have that recorded, and you can listen to it again if you'd like. Elizabeth says, you keep saying that you want to help me. Keep telling my grandfather. And now you're like throwing. Then you try to lie about Craig Cherry, saying, I just made that up. And I heard you talk about it when everything was your plan. Now, to give you context, I'm going to tell you what Tammy Smith is saying. Tammy Smith said, I'd love to hear those plans. Can you think of any? And Elizabeth says, yes, I can. I've already gone over them with you. And Tammy says, um, no, because I don't know what plans you're talking about. And Elizabeth says, what about going to Nashville? What about? And Tammy says, well, besides, besides the one plan, the one idea we had. And Elizabeth said, well, you told me to go to a shelter and pretend like I was being beat. And Tammy says, no, no, I told you instead of running and hiding and changing your identity. And Elizabeth said, you told me to lie and tell people I was being beat. Everything you told me from the very beginning was illegal. Lying about the paternity of the fatherhood, putting your cousin's name. And then she tells Tammy there was no other guy's name to put on the court document. There's no other guy who was the father. What Elizabeth Johnson also didn't know, and what you heard testimony about, was the investigation that the police were doing into Tammy Smith. 
You heard from Detective Ramirez, she was hearing from Tammy Smith quite a bit, and they were in communication with her. You heard from about Deanne and what information Deanne provided to the police. And you know the police were concerned about Tammy's involvement in this case. You know there was a wiretap on Tammy Smith's phone calls and Jack Smith's phone calls and Elizabeth's grandfather's phone calls. And you know the FBI was looking into all of Tammy and Jack Smith's connections in Tennessee. And you know the FBI was looking into all of Tammy and Jack Smith's in San, connections in San Antonio. But yet now Elizabeth is trying to make this all about Tammy Smith and make this whole situation, now that it's bumped up and become more serious, all about Tammy Smith. During this whole process, Elizabeth Johnson had made several statements to different people. They're inconsistent, they're lies. Everything that happened prior to December, 7, December 18th, 2009 is information you can use for intent under the other acts instruction in your instructions. You can consider what Elizabeth Johnson's intent or motive was, what her opportunity or plan was based on those things. On December 8, 2009, she told Gabriel, Logan to take Gabriel with him, and then she reported Gabriel and Logan is missing. On December 9th, she told the police that that incident happened that morning, when it really happened that night. On December 9th, she told the police that Logan had kidnapped Gabriel. On December 22nd, 2009, she sent a, a text message to Logan saying he doesn't care about the family and he only cares about himself. On December 26, 2009, in the phone call, she tells Logan that he doesn't care about the baby one bit. But on December 27, 2009, when she's angry, she tells him he only cares about Gabriel. All he cares about is Gabriel. He doesn't care about Elizabeth. On December 16, 2009, in a text Elizabeth claims to Logan, she has custody of Gabriel. December 16, 2009, she says, I have custody of Gabriel, but Gabriel's with the Smiths. She posted on December 11, she'd given him up for adoption. In fact, Gabriel was with the Smiths from December 9, 2009, when they signed that temporary custody document, until she left town with Gabriel on December 18, 2009, approximately around 5 p.m. On December 11, 2009, Elizabeth told Alicia Shumway of CPS that she gave Gabriel up for adoption, but then on December 14, 2009, she completely denies that conversation with Alicia, Alicia Shumway. On December 14, Alicia assumes Gabriel will remain with Elizabeth because Elizabeth says so. Instead, she gives him back to the Smiths. And then they go to court and file false paperwork. On December 30th, 2009, Elizabeth told the detective that she drove her car to Miami and took a cab to Miami Beach. But on January 5th, 2010, Elizabeth told her grandfather that the car was at a Motel 6 parking lot across from the bus station. She, but she previously told her grandfather that she told the FBI where her car was, that she told them it was at that Motel 6. But you heard from Special Agent Chavez he didn't even talk to her about her car. He only talked to her about the whereabouts of Gabriel. On December 30th, 2009, she claims to Detective Velasquez she's in a, in a running from an abusive boyfriend. But in the confrontation call on January 22nd, 2010, we know from Elizabeth's statements to Tammy that that's all a lie. On December 26, 2009, Elizabeth told Logan in the phone call that he, was, that he had threatened Malcolm Phipps. But Malcolm Phipps came in here and he testified before you and he said that's not true. In fact, he described that Logan was cordial, that he did not harass him, threaten him, or anything. Malcolm Phipps just didn't want to let this guy in. He didn't know what was going on. On December 27, 2009, Elizabeth tells Sergeant Lenzen on the telephone that she's headed back to Phoenix for court. Again, identifying that she was fully aware that we're, there was a court hearing on December 28, 2009. But she's not headed back for court. She's headed in the other direction on a bus. Elizabeth tells Sergeant Lenzen that Gabriel is with her and he's okay. And when Sergeant Lenzen says, I can't hear him, 
Elizabeth responds with, you aren't listening closely enough, are you? On December 29, 2009, Elizabeth checked into the Miami Beach hostile under the name Victoria Evans. She also used that same name when she met up with Detective Velasquez. On December 27, 2009, she told Logan that she had killed Gabriel, that she smothered him, put him in a diaper bag, and put him in a dumpster. But on December 30, 2009, she tells Tammy that Gabriel and she are fine, and that she found somebody to give her new IDs. On December 30, 2009, Elizabeth Johnson tells the detective and the special agent she gave the baby away to a couple, and on January 22, 2010, she tells Tammy Smith, no, you set up that couple. Pretty soon, later this afternoon, you're going to get to hear from Ms. Ramuto, and she's probably going to talk to you a lot about the law. I'm going to talk to you just a few minutes about the charges in this case and the law as it applies. There are three counts to consider. The first count is kidnapping. The dates are important. The dates charged are December 18, 2009 to December 30, 2009. You find the honor between those dates. The crime of kidnapping was committed. Then you can find the defendant guilty. Count two is conspiracy to commit custodial interference. The dates are December 18, 2009 to December 26, 2009. And count three is custo custodial interference, December 18, 2009, December 26, 2009. Now, kidnapping is defined in your jury instructions. In order to find that the defendant has committed kidnapping, you have to find that she knowingly restrained Gabriel Johnson with the intent to place Logan McQuarrie in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury to Gabriel Johnson. So you first have to find that the defendant knowingly restrained Gabriel. And, no, and restraint is defined again in your jury instructions. It says that she restricted Gabriel's movement without consent, without legal authority, and in a manner that interferes substantially with Gabriel's liberty by either moving Gabriel from one place to another or by confining Gabriel. Restraint is without consent if it is accomplished by physical force, intimidation, or deception, or any means including acquiescence of Gabriel if Gabriel is a child less than 18 years of age and Gabriel's lawful custodian has not acquiesced in the movement or confinement. Now we know that from the 20th on, Logan was the lawful custodian of Gabriel Johnson and he certainly didn't acquiesce in Gabriel's movement. The facts that support that charge are the joint custody order on December 17, 2009. Her actions on December 18, 2009 that show she's completely disregarding the order. The phone call that she makes to Logan where she says, you will never see your son again. The fact that she does not provide Gabriel to Logan on December 20th. And the fact that on December 21st, Logan is given temporary emergency custody with a court date on December 28, 2009, which Elizabeth was clearly aware of. On December 26, the last picture of Gabriel that was taken in that hotel room was 7.48 in the morning. On December 27th, at approximately 10 a.m., Elizabeth shows up without Gabriel at the Tornado bus station. We have no idea where Gabriel is from the time that picture's taken and Elizabeth shows up at the bus station. We do know that on December 27th and December 29th, Elizabeth tells Tammy that her intent was to hurt Logan. On January 5th, 2010, in the Channel 5 interview when, with Jack and Tammy and Bob Johnson, she is asked, why would you say to Logan that you killed the baby if you didn't? And she responds, because he ruined my life and he hurt me and I wanted to hurt him and that was the only thing I could that would hurt him. Now on December 27, 2009, Elizabeth tells Logan, I killed Gabriel this morning. She tells him that she has smothered him, put him in a diaper bag, and put him in a, in a dumpster. And she says she did it that morning. The crime of custodial interference requires the defendant to know or have reason to know she has no legal right to do so. She took, enticed, or kept from lawful custody any child entrusted 
by law to the custody of another person. So by law, Lo Gabriel is entrusted to Logan's custody, and yet she took him anyway. On December 18th, she told him he would never see her, his son again, and she skipped town. On December 20th, again, she didn't provide Logan during the court-ordered time. And since December 8th, Logan has not had custody of his son. And he's not seen his son. And since December 8th, Gabriel has not seen his father. Conspiracy requires the same elements as the custodial interference charge, except that you need to find that Elizabeth conspired or agreed with another person, knowing or having reason to know that she had no legal authority to do so, to take, entice, or keep from lawful custody any child entrusted by law to the custody of another person. Tammy and Jack Smith told Logan that the only way Elizabeth would come back with Gabriel is if he signed adoption papers. Elizabeth tells Tammy in the confrontation call that it's Tammy's idea to say she was being beat. Deanne testified about Tammy Smith calling her from court while she's there with Elizabeth, wanting to put a false name on the paternity documents. And, that, and we know that Tammy talked to her cousin, and we know that Craig, her cousin's name, Craig Cherry, ended up on those documents. We also know, and I, if you recall, Mr. Victor asked some of the witnesses about the handwriting and that Craig Cherry being in the document, and he asked, and I can't remember which detective, but it's not one who would know, if there was any evidence that Elizabeth was aware of that. But then you heard later on that Craig Cherry's name was written in Elizabeth Johnson's journal that was found in San Antonio, Texas, when she, after she had fled the state. You heard about Deanne testify about the plan to change jurisdictions to Tennessee. You heard that Tammy put Elizabeth in connection with Janet Morris in Tennessee. You heard that Elizabeth talked to Janet Morris on December 26th. You heard that she talked to her for approximately 40, 45 minutes. And you know that that's essentially the last person she really had a conversation with before she said what she said to Logan McQuarrie. And we know that on December 30th, 2009, in the small amount of property that Elizabeth Johnson had was a GPS device. Now you all asked some really great questions about that GPS device. And some of those really great questions we cannot answer for you. It unfortunately is not one of those GPS devices that tells us where somebody went. If it was, it would probably give us a lot more information that we, that we hoped for, but it's not. And you asked us, how old is the GPS? Do we know who put the information into the GPS? And we can't answer that. But what we can tell you is that it was found on Elizabeth Johnson's person in Miami Beach, Florida. And what we can tell you is that when Detective Bailey did the investigation into it, he found some addresses in there. These are the only addresses in the GPS device. And they are in Texas and Tennessee and Miami Beach. There are no other addresses in there. There's no address in Phoenix. There's no address in Scottsdale. Logan's work information isn't in there. Just the addresses in Houston. San Antonio, Tennessee, and Miami Beach. I want you to think about what was going on in this case. Elizabeth and Logan fought a lot. And many times she fled or she lashed out at Logan McQuarrie. On December 8, 2009, Logan left. They broke up and Logan left. And Elizabeth started her plan. She gave Gabriel away the very next day. And she showed up then at Logan's work telling him that she was giving the baby away, confronting him at work about it. Clearly, Elizabeth Johnson was angry at Logan McQuarrie. And everything she did from that point on, she's angry. And Logan is going to the police, and he's going to court, and he's calling CPS, and he's sending her text messages. And now she's in San Antonio, Texas, and it's she and it's Gabriel. And she hired a babysitter, 
And you could tell from the picture she's bought some baby items or she's got some baby items with her. But now she is alone in San Antonio in a hotel room with her son. And Logan McQueary isn't calling her because Jack told him not to. And she is angry on December 26, 2009, when she talks to him, she's angry at him. And December 27, she tells him, you don't care about me, all you care about is Gabriel. Because she is watching his Facebook post because he's looking for him. And she's angry and she's mad and she's now spent Christmas alone in a hotel room with Gabriel Johnson and she wants to get back at Logan and she's upset. And she uses the one thing that she knows would hurt Logan more than anything. It would be hurting Gabriel Johnson. That's the one thing that would hurt Logan more than anything, is to believe that his son could be in danger. And she uses that against him. And she uses it against Gabriel. By using Gabriel as a pawn, she hurts Gabriel. He is seven months old and had not seen his father since December 8, 2009. You have heard all of the evidence you need in this case to find that Elizabeth Johnson is guilty of each and every one of the charges we've charged. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Andrews.